This is really learning from history part six. Uh, one to five are now on DVDs, if anybody's interested, but this adds on to the previous story where I'm trying to present the skeleton, if you like, of our human history, and I hope to put a little bit more meat on it with this particular talk. So here we go. That is uh, a wonderful image of uh, Christian O'Brien and Barbara Joy, which is in the Telegraph, something like 1974, I think. That was his main uh, first really exciting thing, to find that there was a line, which he called Line A, from Hatfield Forest to Wandlebury, um, 26 megalithic miles, and markers precisely each megalithic mile. Um, didn't find all of them, but most of them. And it's a loxodrome, which is a curved surface on the line of the Earth, which is parallel to the meridian. And it's essential for what was called meridian astronomy, where astronomy first started. So in 2,500 BC, uh, the people living in East Anglia were clever enough to put that marker on the ground. And to do that, they must have known the exact dimensions of the Earth. The really exciting bit now is that this line points west of current due north. And I haven't checked it out yet, but it looks as though it could be pointing to the Hudson Bay uh, North Pole uh, before the Earth was shifted on its axis. And that is part of the story I'm going to tell and the consequences of that happening and how that has affected everything that has happened to us over the last 12,000 years. The second really important thing was to establish that there was a major observational astronomy university on Bodmin Moor with more stones moved than the Great Pyramid. And that was where Druids from all over Europe, uh, most of the known world, came to be taught observational astronomy. That's why we have such incredibly high standards of knowledge in these ancient times, because the traditions were carried down throughout the Druidic colleges and universities. These are the two key books. Some people are calling the genius of the few the new Bible because it really does give you the Bible story uh, in a far more sensible way, not about God in heaven, but about the bright ones, intelligent ones, the shining ones in the planted highlands. Um, it's full of, full of information, in particular an alternative translation of the Genesis text, which now makes sense, and also uh, in great detail, the Sumerian uh, story, creation story, or story of the Garden of Eden, which is called, uh, uh, called Karsag, and it's the Karsag epics from the Nippa Library, which are crucial to our understanding of the past going back in time. The Shining Ones is the masterwork. They're all sold out. I hope later on in the year I'll be able to uh, do another print run, but that does depend on support for the DVDs and buying the genius of the few. There are the uh, part one, two, three, and four, um, and they all break down into component parts. There's some mixing between the two, but um, about 140 slides on each one, so there's packed full of information on a whole range of subjects. So anybody who I've spoken to quickly for or thrust too much at uh, can go back and look at that. Also, they can look at it too on the Holistic Channel, um, and there's a card downstairs if you want to pick that up and simply look at it on your computer at home. But you won't get the quality and be able to do it as well as you would if you bought a DVD. Now, like every uh, aspect of history, particularly looking at our history of our planet and the people on it, one of the key points we have to do is look at the big picture um, of our Milky Way galaxy uh, and our solar system. Uh, that's a wonderful image, and you can see there the sun um, just there. That's us. So even before you got up this morning, uh, uh, you were uh, lying on a large stone, which is traveling at 66,600 miles an hour um, through this extraordinary uh, area of uh, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, ducking and diving over time through these spiral arms. And that has a major impact on our climate, our weather, and everything that's happening here. And it's only this fantastic research in the last 10 years that should be able to understand that we go from dry periods uh, to wet periods to hot periods to cold periods, largely because of the impact of cosmic rays raining down upon us. 
I put this up because I think it's crucial we look at the size of the Sun, uh, Mercury, uh, Venus, the Earth, Mars and the other planets, particularly how close we are to Mars and the relationships between those two, which I'm going to touch on later. But if you think that CO2 here uh, is actually going to have any impact on what this chap's doing here, in my opinion, you're completely mad. But that's another story which I'm not going to get into at this moment. The issues about our extraordinary universe are that it needs 2030 uh, disciplinary skills to begin to understand what's happening um, and, and in particular begin to look at what has happened and this is the Sun solar activity and how we're protected by the magnetic fields that we have and also that um, go around our particular solar system and here we have an outer boundary of the heliosphere here which protects us from radiation from the rest of our galaxy and it's very very important to see here but that uh, particular boundary is weakening at the moment, shrinking and getting weaker. And that will have impacts on our weather uh, in the short and longer term, possibly. The one thing we're worried about in 2012 is this galactic alignment, and that could mean very fierce solar storm from the sun or something coming into our sun, making the sun very active for a short period of time, which will give us adverse conditions. That's what we've been warned about not so much by the Mayans, but the Sumerians and the Egyptians uh, all are on the same tack. The teaching originally came from the land of Canaan to Sumeria to the Mayans. And I'm going to show you all those links as we go through. Just some of the problems. There's a lovely image of Comet Hale Bop. That's an um, artist um, visualization of cometary debris, an actual event that took place over Chesapeake Bay. This is actually uh, a lovely image, first time we've actually photographed a comet of this type in deep space, and that's due to come somewhere near us in about 2016, but I don't think it'll give us any trouble. That is the kind of what we call a dark comet, dark matter, which brightens up and flares as it comes through our atmosphere. That's what happened in Tugunskrun, Siberia, 2008, an area the size of Belgium was devastated. Uh, and there is uh, at least a 100 or a centennial risk of this kind of incident uh, uh, now and an increased risk as we go through the next 100 years. This is the work of Professor Victor Klub, uh, the top Oxford astrophysicist, and you can see here at these particular junctures and these dates, um, you have problems. We had problems around about 3,000, Big problems, 22,400. We had problems here again, 2020, 1300. These are all BC, 500 BC, um, 280 uh, BC, AD, and then 1200. And we're going to run into more problems from the Torrid stream in the next 100 years. He was very worried and concerned about that and was pretty upset that nobody took him seriously. These are the impacts in recent historical times. There have been three Tugunska type events, 1930, 35, and 47. And the two big ones I'm going to feature a little bit later on are the one of an asteroid hitting the um, Austrian Alps. There was a television program about that a short while ago. Fascinating. It had been forecasted to the day by the Sumerian astronomers using a planisphere and the methods they used to calculate the movements of these kind of objects, quite staggering. And we've been looking and talking all this last two days about how sophisticated observational astronomy was and how precise and accurate our surveyors uh, and uh, the people who um, were doing the technical things four, five, six thousand years ago. And we're going to follow that trail as well. Now, I'm starting with what we call the big event. This is the latest research, the best information um, from our top scientists about a major event at 10,500 BC. I put 10,750 because there were two big heat events here and our problem is actually the carbon dating because with the kind of problems we've had, we've had big movements up and down with the carbon which means that our carbon dates always need correcting and most people know that we've been pushing dates back further and further with more knowledge about dating methods. So debris from a supernova explosion of 39,000 BC, and I'm not going to talk about the other bits, the flash 
and the shock wave because I dealt with that in previous talks. But we're talking about debris from a supernova explosion arriving in our solar system um, at this particular juncture here. This is a typical story of nearly every tribe that has any kind of tradition. And I'm not going to read it all. Um, the great, the creator God told them, uh, appearing, so they saw him, and the creator God said, go dig a large pit, cover it with logs, and pile sand over the top. After it is done, seal yourselves up inside the pit for protection. Just as they finished sealing themselves inside, the creator sent a terrible rain of fire and hail down up from the sky to destroy the world. The family began to fear that the pit was not deep enough to protect them, but soon the noise stopped and the roof of the pit grew cooler to touch. Some animals and a few other people survived to rebuild the world. That story appears time and time again, one of the most reliable stories we have on the planet. So there was the existence of somebody regarded as a real person, creator God, at this time. And this was retold from 1880 from Brett, a very good historian on the subject. And it's in this key book, The Cycle of Cosmic Catastrophes, by Richard Firestone, Alan West, and Simon Warwick Smith. Now, who were the people at this time? We have this Clovis fulsome boundary, but we need to look at what's happening to us. We're, in reality, certainly on the male side, very, very recent. And all three of these, if you like, so-called races um, are, all have a common male Y chromosome at about 50,000 BC, shown by the M158 marker, which is in the blood of all three. We also, believe it or not, have within Sumer an in Sumerian encyclopedia of astronomy, and it's accredited to Anu and Enil, or An and Enil, and I'm sure many of you heard, have heard about that. These names have been banded around over the last uh, 50 years in all sorts of areas. But Enuma, I think, in my best interpretation, in the beginning, Anu and Enil, the Sumerian Encyclopedia of Astronomy, a set of tablets. So we have more evidence of key people around five, uh, their influence, five, 6,000 BC, and they produced an encyclopedia of astronomy. It, within these uh, Sumerian records, we have this story, which Sitchin followers will recognize straight away, but other people, other scholars who did not accept Sitchin's work have looked at this in great detail, uh, geologists, and what they're saying is, wow, they've identified all the planets, and they've also identified a missing planet. The missing planet is Tiamat, and it was smashed to pieces in this particular catastrophe when debris came through our system. And this is the same story that Plato talks about, about Phaeton's chariot uh, being out of control and having a dramatic effect, putting Pluto into a different orbit, affecting Neptune, Uranus, uh, Chiron, uh, the moon there, Saturn being pushed out of the way, big collision here creating the asteroid belt. Mars, close to Mars, maybe this is the time when Mars's atmosphere was stripped away, although it does have some atmosphere now. A Kingu launched into Earth, and this large object coming through would have provided sufficient torque to tip the Earth on its axis, and this is a story that we have. Past Venus, putting Venus in a reverse spin um, and moving it, maybe, maybe even Venus came close to the Earth, we're not sure. But this is the best analysis from two of the top men in the world, Derek Allen and J.B. Dallaire. Derek Allen has now died, but they wrote this fantastic book, which is originally called When the Earth Nearly Died, and is now called Cataclysm. That's the Firestone book and the big impact, looking at a big impact here, uh, and all the heavy metals in this area, and all the clues we have, the Carolina Bays, Dismal Bay, a radioactive Earth from objects coming in from space. And those objects would have contained ice, water that have frozen, nitrogen gas, which would have frozen, a supercooled, which has frozen the Earth down to two or 300 feet when it clouded in, maybe over Siberia. Uh, absolutely extraordinary period of time when the Earth was in absolute turmoil and the Earth's crust was being moved very, very dramatically, far more dramatically than anybody in this room can, ma can imagine. And this is what our geologists are now telling us. 
in order to be able to get the correct record of what ice ages were all about and what our geology and crustal movements are all about and why we have very old rocks on top of new rocks, young rocks. The reconstruction of the world before the catastrophe, we're looking at a very large amount of land. You see the coastline of England here and the continental shelf, which we can see, very solid. We know this is all very solid because the Earth's crust is very thick here. And it runs from Africa out to the Azores and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is very important. I'm going to come to that later. And it runs across here, um, and we find that we've got solid land right the way across from Africa to South America. Uh, a great sea in the middle of the Sahara Desert, which explains so much of the geology there. Um, and in fact, we've got a situation where we have a massive sea from the Austria, Germany area, Hungary area, right the way across to the uh, Aral Sea. And that includes the Black Sea and the area around the north of the Black Sea, um, the geological evidence for that uh, being underwater as recently as 10,000 years ago. The um, interesting features here, Graham Hancock was talking about Japan and that being above sea level uh, before the catastrophe. There was quite a lot of evidence of that. Uh, I, did, um, I researched the subject for him when he started on Yonaguni and uh, my conclusion then talking to Japanese experts was that this land along this ridge here on which Yoni, Yon, Yon, Yonaguni Island was part down here um, had in fact been coming upwards. It was uh, right on the edge of what we call uh, called a plate. Um, and um, at that time, I thought that it um, was a natural object. And I think there's still a debate over that subject. But his, his material last night was very impressive and interesting. And always, we have to keep an open mind. Always be prepared to change our minds. Always be prepared to search for the truth. Now, the Druid motto was the secular pursuit of knowledge above everything. And that's really what's so important today. This is the power of a tsunami. This is one which came down, a large object in the Indian Ocean. Um, and it, actually, these cliffs are 600 feet high, the chevrons of debris picked up by a tsunami. So the tsunami was about 1,000 feet high. So if you don't believe in 1,000 foot high tsunamis coming out of the oceans and the seas, there is a perfect example, practical example, of what actually happens. Three miles in from the ocean, it deposited all that material. We see them along the coast of Australia, many parts of the world. Britain had one as recently as 1608 up the Severn Estuary. We had a much bigger one, I think about 7,500 BC. And we're only just beginning to understand and see what it all means. Now, the message of axis shift, the Earth tipping on its axis during this cataclysm, is encoded in the Great Pyramid and in the layout of other early structures around the planet, including written rock records, particularly the Books of Enoch. And of course, Thoth, Hermes, Mercury are all different names for the same person. This is the Hebrew word for the same individual, a great historian who say, uh, provided these records for us, and we've only really just begun to understand how to translate his work, and that's a feature of O'Brien's work within the genius of the few. But my message that I'm putting to you is that we have, if we look at the evidence, proof that there was an, an advance, the existence of an advanced civilization. Our ancestors were wonderful, benevolent people who went to enormous trouble to leave messages, laws, social organization par excellence for us. Forget the conspiracy theory. They're all things that have happened in the last three, 4,000 years when we lost it. We lost the golden age, it collapsed, and it collapsed because of another great catastrophe around about 2,346, which I'm gonna to touch on. This is the book um, I've written part of this book, a very small part, with John Gagnon, who is a Canadian researcher, a um, fabulous man in my opinion, and it's called, it's the Great Pyramid and the Hudson Bay Pole. And this is the message left for us within the Great Pyramid. Now what we're saying is that the Earth was hit over Hudson Bay and it was tipped on its axis, which meant that the ice cap, the Arctic ice cap, was moved into the temperate zone in this direction. That's the reason for all the rapid melting and also the complete um, misunderstanding by geologists of ice ages 
Um, it just needs, we now have to rewrite all the books and the knowledge about ice ages and where ice formed. Uh, and we can now do that from the evidence we've got. The one good thing about all the debate on climate change is that it's focused everybody's attention onto the kind of research that needs looking at very carefully in order to be able to sort out the wheat from the chaff or the truth from the nonsense. And so hopefully a lot of good will come from the debate, providing we don't waste any money and spend the 500 billion pounds to start with uh, totally unnecessarily. And probably the wrong things, because we probably need to be thinking about the earth getting cooler rather than warmer. This is the king's chamber, which you're all familiar with in the Great Pyramid, and the Rastar shafts. And Robert Beauval did a lot of the early work, and other people too. But what John Gagnon is saying, that these shafts pointed or, to the Alpha Draconis, which is the North Star, Zeta Orionis, the South Star, and the Orions in the Orion's belt. It's very important because that is reproduced on the ground for very good reason. We find the same offset in the Chinese pyramid, big Chinese pyramid, and, and there are all the clues. What Hancock was talking about at Angkor Wat is, in my opinion, was that they knew at Angkor Wat about this axis shift, and what they had to do is to do a tremendous amount of work to recalibrate everything, to take into account the fact that the Earth had tipped. And they knew that. So that our understanding of it now, once we realize and accept axis shift, we can understand what so many of our astro-archaeologists um, are all been trying to do and work on. The Queen's Chamber shaft um, show where the Alpha Draconis and Zeta Orionis were um, when or when we or before the catastrophe happened. So the Earth was tipped, and it, that is recorded for us a message for us in the two chambers, Queen's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. But we know about all the mathematics which is encoded in the Great Pyramid. But what we're looking at is a great deal more than we ever realized. This is, for example, the measurement of 28 degrees. Giza before the event and after the event. But about half of that is made up of the movement of the Earth's crust, would you believe, as well as the fact that the Earth tipped on its planet. So we had massive disruptions of the Earth's crust. And if you talk to a sea level man, he will not know enough about geology. And if you talk to a geology man, he will not know enough about sea level. So the difficulty in doing research on this subject is actually finding people with broad enough minds and detailed enough research to really be able to pin these issues down. And I believe that John Gagnon here has done that better than anybody. We have the orientation of the Great Pyramid causeways. Uh, I'm going to talk about these pyramids. These causeways, in my opinion, were to get people into the structures and around the structures very quickly when there was a warning that trouble was coming. And here we have 14 degrees and 14 degrees, which equals the 28 you saw on the previous slide. And something like 14% of that, 14 degrees shift of axis, and the rest of it was 14 degrees shift of the Earth's crust. That's how dramatic it was. And here, within the Great Pyramid, we have this recorded again, the mathematical representation of Earth's changes. Um, Giza was at 16 degrees, but stars aligned as if at 2 degrees axis shift, and that is adjusted in here. And all these points and markers within the Great Pyramid tell us a whole range of things, um, astronomical things, about these times. So it doesn't take much to see just what incredibly sophisticated people our ancestors actually were and what they've done for us. Um, there is the, uh, we have a, a big crater in the Hudson Bay, we have the Great Lakes crater, and we have a crater in Prince Edward Island and others around the planet. That was all part of this bombardment of debris from the supernova explosion, which would have gone right the way through uh, our own um, galaxy. Here is a good example. That would have been thick with ice, maybe two miles of ice, but we still have a situation where it disrupted um, plaza, the, the actual um, Earth's crust and, and, um, and, and volcanic rock came out on this edge and we have um, uh, uh, lots of evidence of um, a big impact here even though we had two miles of ice protecting us. Um, it's still, we've still got lots of evidence on the ground on that point. 
The same, this is the, this is the ice, what we know here is that we've got a one kilometre rebound in this area. And that one, millit one, millimeter, uh, one kilometre rebound is this business of the land coming back up again after the hit. Um, and people have put that down, oh, it was the weight of the ice that pushed it down. Um, but now we're looking at that, or the experts are looking at that in a different way. Um, there is the Great Lakes Crater, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. You can see a crater, kind of crater there. This was a six foot er high erratic boulder, uh, which was blasted a thousand miles from the Belcher Islands in Hudson Bay to North Dakota. It's the only place you find this particular rock, Belcher Islands, and there was loads of it scattered over North Dakota, a long way away. Carolina Bays, you know about those, most of you, and these, all the bays here, you see the direction, they all point back either to the Great Lakes or to Hus Hus Hudson Bay. And another big impact too over Finland, and we've all been told that Finland and this area of Sweden, that's all coming up uh, and rising. I've been to Finland and seen, it's been going, going up quite quickly even now. Uh, Finland was below sea level at one point, but they've all put that down to the fact that the ice is melted and therefore it's coming up uh, because the weight of the ice is there no more. But we have another reason for that and another impact crater. The orientation of the Great Pyramid Causeway, as I say, I've done that already. I can't believe I put two of them in, but I have. Um, this is the Sphinx here. Um, and, uh, sorry, the, the, yes, the orientation of the causeways. I've managed to put two slides in. Um, our ancient sites aligned to the Hudson Bay Pole. And Teotihuacan, I can't pronounce it, but you know what I mean. Southern Mexico, fantastic site, aligned 15 degrees northeast to the Hudson Bay. Tionaco, I can pronounce that one, um, and, this, and it's actually much lower, a bit lower down, I think, but never mind. Um, but that also seems to be aligned to the Hudson Bay Pole. And messages left, very important. And this is Mexico. We've actually got a very clear 15 degree um, on that fantastic avenue, which you all, all remember, that lovely photograph. And there may well have been civilizations on this site going back a long, much further than, than we realize. And as I say, that points um, to the um, Hudson Bay North Pole. The alignment is to the Hudson Bay North Pole, a message for us. Uh, Tianaco, similar situation where you've got um, um, a four degree offset to um, the actual, that's the north today, that was the north in 10,400 BC. That's a lovely view over Lake Titicata looking north up the Andes. This is a very, very interesting area, all sorts of features here. I'm going to touch on some of those. Copper in Bolivia, uh, Tianaco's in Bolivia. Um, we had uh, the most fantastic city of all, Pasha Carmack, which has been excavated and looked at by a couple called the Verils, but hasn't entered the mainstream of archaeology, which is a shame. And there's a tremendous amount of information here, which has just escaped everybody, because what was being said was that was Sumerian. Those were the Indus Valley peoples who had colonized this part of the world as early as 4000 BC. The idea that uh, everything developed independently on the planet is the most woolly, ludicrous suggestion ever made. Another fantastic area, very close to very good agricultural land, which can be irrigated from the river there. Now, axis shift is followed uh, by more than a thousand years of ice age conditions. It's globally, it's called the Younger Dryas. The planet starts to warm up again around 9,500 BC with vegetation marching north from glacial refuges. So if we, the Younger Dryas was as cold as anything we've ever seen before on the planet, and it was for a thousand years. So you can imagine the dramatic effect that had on the whole planet, not just the northern regions. And so we have to look at where were the places that the key plants, the wheats, and so the wild, wild grasses, which eventually became wheat and barley, uh, the potassio, the oak, a lot of these, uh, the olive, where are those things actually came from? Where were the glacial refuges? And plants are great because when the weather um, comes out nicely and they get rain on them and they're off, the seeds blow away in the wind and you know but some weeds uh, can invade whole countries. Give them a couple of thousand years, it's amazing what plants can do. So what we had to have at that particular juncture 
Um, and what I'm going to explain to you now was a restart of agriculture and civilization. Um, the name is Eden, but the Sumerians called it Kar Sag, which means uh, head enclosure. Kar, well like gar or garden, means enclosure. Sag means head. And if you want to look at the proto-Sumerian language, the vertical picture signs, which go back five or 6,000 BC, from which uh, the cuneiform came from, you can see that downstairs on the Phaistos disc. And the Phaistos disc is a lovely story about the great cattle of the great lords and the great lady uh, breaking out of the field, knocking over the beehives, causing absolute mayhem, and having to be rounded up and put back in again. Classic, typical farming story. It does, I think, double as a calendar for some of the more mathematically minded people, but it's a, a fantastic object and it would have been taken um, to uh, Crete by the time of Menes. Menes and Minos are the same person. And Menes was in fact the son of Sargon I and he was the governor of the Indus Valley colony of the Sumerians um, when they decided to break everything up and have individual uh, areas. Um, then he became king of Egypt. And the reason for that was another great catastrophe which we're going to touch on. So what we have here is the restart of agriculture and civilization at Karsag by the survivors of the cataclysm led by Anne, who was always a monotheistic system led by Anne, always. Enil, Ninkarsag, and Enki. And you'll recognize these names. You'll certainly recognize archangels, angels, and watchers who were the teachers and craftsmen. And they were three orders. These guys were called two-eyed serpents, they were called one-eyed serpents, and they were just called watchers because they were looking and watching. <laughs> um, but they didn't have the two eyes that the archangels had. And of course, they were, up in, they were promoted up the ranks with, depending on how good they were. And a representative of the watchers always sat on the Anunnaki, or archangels, council. So 9,500 BC, we find at the end of this Younger Dryas extreme cold period, things picking up. Now these are what are called the culture bearers who took education, knowledge, this advanced civilization all around the world. The earliest known settlements are in this rift valley from the Dead Sea here, very important, up to this area here. And we've got the natural habitat for wild emma in green, this area here. That is a glacial refuge, a key glacial refuge for many of the crops wild thing, wild plants that became the domesticated crops and I've dealt with that in previous lectures. Very, very important. And domesticated animals also are getting animals arriving here along with the domesticated crops all about the same time in about the same area. And this is a southern limit of rain-fed agriculture at this time on this red line. So rain-fed agriculture was important but in reality they had to have irrigation to make it work. Any farmer knows that you have to control water all the time to be able to have a successful farming operation. So it had to be irrigation right from the start, and we're going to look at that. The blue sites are very early Paleolithic, Epipaleolithic sites, and then we have what's called the pre-pottery Neolithic. They couldn't find any pottery, so they called it pre-pottery Neolithic, but it relates to Jericho, Angazar, um, Tel Aswa, which is very close to Damascus. And we're going to be looking at a site just here, very close, as the site for the Garden of Eden and Karsa. Uh, other earliest known settlements up in Syria, Jerf al Arma, Tel Aba, um, Muribet, Abu Huraira, Sabi Abiyah, just here, which is a very, very ancient town, a little bit later on. And the other towns from the Zagros and then down into the Mesopotamian plains. Now the key evidence which supports this thesis is following this trail of agriculture. And this research was produced uh, just over a year ago now by these three people. Uh, and they looked at um, 735 archeological sites and to trace the origins of agriculture. And they picked out these 10 probable centers of origin. And so we have these sites here as the most likely place for the start of agriculture. And this is for agriculture worldwide, because this is where you find the earliest dates and many of the crops, and even maize being found here at 7,500 BC, which was dismissed by the establishment, but that decision was made by two of the finest botanists, Dutch botanists, Bottomar and Zeist. But because they said something that didn't fit in with the establishment view, um, 
they literally lost their reputations, and this is the problem. Who's going to tell us the truth if they step over the line, the establishment line? And this is our big problem today, as you know. Very interesting, because you average these sites out, you come down somewhere in the region of um, uh, Damascus here. Very important. Now this is where the gods chose to come. They chose the Bekar Valley, which is between these two mountains, the Lebanon Mountains and the anti-Lebanon Mountains, and Mount Hermon is here, and we're going to look at Mount Hermon. And this is the river Dan, uh, which goes down just above Galilee, and this is where Jesus' favorite place was just below Mount Hermon here. And he's talk there's a lot talked about him going there and going up into this area here. Then we have get Galilee, and we have several intermon, five or six intermontane valleys, which, as they're called, into the Sea of Galilee, where tremendous sophistication has been found um, at about 8,000 BC. And then down here we go down, this drops down, so when he gets to Jericho, it's about 600 feet below sea level, then the Dead Sea. But we're finding lots of early agriculture and settlements here. And um, one of the top American agricultural specialists said farming must have started between Jericho and Damascus, which I'm going to show you it did. This is Christian O'Brien's um, um, produced this map. It was based on a, a French Ordnance Survey map to look at all the possible locations in this area. And as one of the world's top geologists, he was able to read maps and do all sorts of incredible things with maps. Um, when he first met my aunt, um, and she, he was taken to see my Uncle Pat, who was my aunt's father. Uh, he said, like all the uh, elderly guys, and what do you do, young man? And Christian O'Brien said, well, I've just been working out how far the Rocky Mountains have moved in the last 30 million years. <laughs> and he had, and I've got an incredible geology document of that particular work, which was published. But he identified, looked at these sites, and he identified this as the best location. He had the Sumerian records, he had the geology, he had all sorts of clues here about Sacred Mountain, uh, the home of the sons of God, and in particular the books of Enoch, because Enoch was taken up to the, see the great Lord uh, up in heaven uh, or up in here uh, and to record all that was going on. And that's one of the key, another key clue. So we have the Genesis text, we have the books of Enoch, and we have the Sumerian records, three totally independent sources to establish the story. So there is the Garden of Eden site. It's an old lake bed. Uh, it's drained down there or was drained down there. At the moment, it gets flooded because, would you believe, the old water course, the great water course, which drained the lake to make farming possible, was destroyed during what they called a thousand-year storm. And it's all documented in the Sumerian records, which were found in the Nippo Library in 1898 uh, by a team from the University of Pennsylvania. And he stayed in the basement of the University of Pennsylvania quite a long while. And it was only recently, thanks to Samuel Noah Kramer, and in particular Christian O'Brien, that these documents have been translated. And of course nobody accepts it or wants to know about it, but that's another story. Looking across the basin, we can see where the actual Enil's, Enil's great house was. Uh, there was a reservoir in this valley here, which was perfect for collecting water from the flanks of Mount Hermon. And here we have now, even now, a fabulous fertile basin. That is uh, not far from Annual's house on the hill, looking down into the valley, and it's the rainwater coming down into this valley, which allows water to be collected for a reservoir. Um, and here we have another wonderful view of the kind of limestone rocks here, and how level that area was. So it could be irrigated on a big scale, very important. This is the story we're all familiar with. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And a river. Now, a river is a translation of a word, but it could just as easily mean watercourse. And what O'Brien was suggesting, and I'm suggesting, is it does mean watercourse went out of Eden to water the garden. Now rivers don't go out of Eden garden, don't go out of Eden to water gardens, but water courses do. And this adds to it. From whence it was parted. Well you don't part rivers. Most rivers uh, um, have a whole load of tributaries come into one main river. But if it was parted, we're talking about sluices. And then even more uh, confirming we have and became into four heads irrigation channels. Four irrigation channels. The first name of the first is Paisal. 
name of the second river or channel is Gihon, name of the third river, Hedikar. Uh, that, and this is an interesting little point. That is which goes towards the east of Assyria. Well, Assyria wasn't even invented until about eight and a half thousand years after the actual event itself. So you can see how this story has been lost in time. But basically, it's right. And so much of the Bible is basically right, needs retranslating, needs looking at in a more constructive way, and to realize just how much we've lost over time of the original translations and how it's been put together for people to pump their own particular version of events. That's typical of history. It's always written by the victors or people who want to manipulate and control other people. You don't get paid much for telling the truth. And somebody once said that if you tell a lie, you're very unpopular. But if you tell the truth, you really upset people. So here we have it. Here we have a reservoir, Enio's great house, um, buildings, and these are not the actual placements, but speculative placements of the structures mentioned in the Karsak epics on page 313 of the Genius of the Few. And the great watercourse, you see the great watercourse shown here. Now, O'Brien did all this before we had Google. And Google, look, I've waited for years for that to happen. And right on the Google image, we've got exactly where O'Brien said it would be, on the contours, um, a great, what I believe is a rock-cut ditch, an incredible watercourse, which you can see from the satellite. Another one there, it's going back from the dam, and Enel's great house is here, and it goes out and takes all the storm water into the Wadi Nirab uh, and drains the basin. But in the summer, when it's always very dry, even now, and certainly was then, the water, this great watercourse acts as a reservoir along with this reservoir. It keeps getting topped up and the water can go through the sluices into the garden, the four sluices. And I, on one of the images, I thought I could definitely see one of the sluices. And on Red Eyes Creations, about three weeks ago, I gave an open invitation to anybody who wants to, to go to Beirut, get a driver, go down there, talk to the farmers if you can speak the language, and look for yourself and maybe be the first person to provide some good photographs of it. More, another image, these are where O'Brien thought the watchers' houses may be. They may be emplacements from the war between uh, Hezbollah and the um, Israelis, I don't know. But it's very interesting, and it looks as though another channel, a watercourse, came in bringing flood water or storm water from this direction, because they were clearly desperate to get all the water they could during the summer months, but desperately worried in the winter months that there was going to be too much water from the mountain for this to all flood and fail. But it, it worked very well. For 3,000 years, it was headquarters for the Anunnaki. Now, favorable conditions of farming after thousands of years of climatic chaos, another key point in our story. This is the rate of temperature change over 100-year intervals since 47,920 uh, BC to the present day. And you can see how hostile the environment was. And then it settled down. And this is our recent time. This is the Holocene, the wholly recent period of time. Key graph to tell you how hostile our planet was up to this point in time when we find agriculture and civilization arising. And good old CO2, um, if it wasn't for CO2, plants wouldn't grow. People running big greenhouses and want plants to grow pump CO2 into them. Um, the planet is what it is today because of CO2. Uh, water vapor, and we had a lovely talk yesterday about water and the importance of water. Water makes up 86% of the greenhouse gases, and CO2 is a very minor element. And to suggest it has any effect upon our climate, and I can tell you, um, and, and you can take it or leave it, 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 the story that we're having at the moment thrust down our throats is utter nonsense. Now, here is the warming, end of the last glacial. And this chart tells us that it was a little bit of a bumpy ride. We didn't really get going until we get to this Holocene climatic optimum here, which is about 4,200. And this is where we begin to find people obviously done well in the Near East, but coming here to Britain. And the fires to clearing land and for grazing animals on Exmoor ties in with about 4,200, which is the top of this peak. And then we get another, another peak here, about um, 2,350. 
um, and they coincide with these climatic optimums. The sea levels obviously uh, peaked at these high spots and maybe sea level did in fact go down a bit during the cold spots. And we're down here, so you can see we're nowhere near as warm as we have been. Britain was two degrees warmer at the time of Stonehenge, which was built, and had double the rainfall up on Salisbury Plain. And there was another maybe one or two feet of good topsoil there as well. The Canaanites, they were also called the Paunch in the Vedas, and the Paunch were uh, heroes um, who traveled the world, or Aryans, same story, but uh, Hitler used that one and gave them a bad name. And anybody daring to use the word Aryan was struck off the list. Another great tragedy, because the actual word means noble ones. So public relations is still winning the day. The seas have been mastered from the earliest times. Jericho in the Jordan Valley, next really important site after Karsag, and this is the Tel Al Sultan here, and that is the passage or excavation by Kathleen Kenyon in 1954, which gave us a fabulous benchmark on finding a very sophisticated, oldest city in the world at this incredibly early date. Another wonderful clue. And this particular drawing shows that rock cut ditch better than any other can. It's massive, it's eight or nine feet deep, 30 feet wide, and it's through solid rock. So the people who came to Karsag were capable of cutting through solid rock, uh, both Karsag and Jericho, and this was the domain of Enki. And there's another picture of it. And my view is, and certainly the design of a tower, which we're gonna look at in a minute, would suggest the wall and the ditch were flood prevention, not to make a fort. It was certainly a, 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 grew into a city. It was very important, central administration, etc. But I don't see any evidence of saying there were wars going on here at all. I think it was built specifically for flood protection in that particular low-lying area. And remember, these people had lived through the most horrific catastrophe. So here we have a great stone tower, um, and it would have been a trading and production center for food, salt, and bitumen, and probably the Anunnaki headquarters in the Jordan lowlands under Enki. And this excavations represent the benchmark for dating the Holocene evolution of farming and civilization. If you're any kind of researcher or historian, you have to take the Jericho evidence right at the top of a tree to build a chronology and picture of our history. Sadly, very few people have. And this is the, uh, we see a roof of large slabs, hammer dressed to a flat surface. This is big stones being used at this early date. This tower would not disgrace one of the more grandiose medieval castles, says Kathleen Kenyon in charge of the excavation. And she says here, the labor involved in excavating this ditch out of solid rock must have been tremendous. So there's evidence of sophistication and great, uh, great, uh, thoroughness and efficiency. Now we've, this is the big excitement at Gobleki Tepe, largely because somebody's written a book, and it's mostly about human sacrifice and how these people was a cult and, and how it was religious and temples and all the rest of it. And, and, and it may sell very well, I don't know, that's a lot, of, a lot of public like the conspiracy theory stories, but in terms of reality and fact, it doesn't come anywhere near what is actually going on here. And what we have are buildings, uh, walls, thick walls, um, right on the top, highest point of a ridge, an elongated mountain ridge, about 15 kilometers northeast of San Herfa, Urfa in southeast Turkey. And these are roof supports. There are maybe, I think, 100 or more of them, but they're very clearly roof supports. And I didn't think I needed to do any more than show this image to show that these would have been roof supports and on top would have had an immensely strong roof. Go back to our story about dig a pit, cover it with logs cover it with soil, same basic principle. But inside, look at this beauty, wonderful beauty. And they all think it's a headless man down here, but I really can't see it. But this is just wonderful stuff, absolutely wonderful. 
reliefs of vultures, scorpion, and what they have actually are all the basic animals which were in this area at the time, and they were hunter-gatherers, not a scrap of evidence of any agriculture as such, but it was an important settlement. It may well have been um, a little industrial site, it may well have been an st uh, important staging post, it could have been an observation astronomy point as well for angels and watchers because they went off in groups and parties literally around the world. Uh, setting up places like this to, so they could then teach the local populations how to farm and how to live and how to do things properly. And most of all, the principal roles for people to live peacefully together with superb social organisation. When we get to Baalbek, from the very earliest records, we have that is actually a late tablet. Um, and it says, All we great, it's a copy obviously coming down. It says, All we great Ananuki or Anunnaki, as O'Brien prefers to call them, which is the correct translation, decided to go on a rule. Anu and Adad would rule the highlands. And this is written by en en Enil. I, Enil, would rule the lowlands. Enil comes through as Yahweh too, as the god, um, for many thousands of years. I'm not saying he lived that long. It was a titular title, as they say. Um, that Gabriel was a titular title. She was, met, was simply the governor of the Garden of Eden. And that goes right through into the Hebrew, um, where the Gabriel went to visit Mary, the mother of Jesus, to decide on when she would be impregnated to have a, a son who was eligible for kingship. But that's another story. But look, we just want to see Anu, An, An or Anu and Adad. It was called Anu in the Akkadian language. The names change, and that makes life a lot more difficult. But even in Sumer, we find um, a double temple to these two, Anu and Hadad. And of course, that's An and Hadad. Very, very interesting. This is the incredible spring. And of course, Jericho had an, an incredible spring with a thousand gallons a minute. And this is a similar situation. Water supply was everything in these places. And we know that's important. We know it was important at Avebury, uh, West Kennet, all these stories of people on the Marlborough Downs needed to be near water. And that is the massive platform, and that is the water coming from that spring down that, cha that big channel, still there, working today, into a pond here. That was the water supply. And this is what we call a great platform. And we don't know what form it originally took, um, where the accommodation was, but they built big platforms right from the start. And I'm going to deal with that because there were very good reasons for building a big platform. Uh, that's the uh, Roman temple, which came much later. M starting probably, it was based on a Canaanite temple, which may have been uh, older than Solomon's temple, but the Romans flocked to this site from all over the Roman Empire, from India, everywhere. They came here to pay their respects to the gods. And many of you will know that Hadrian uh, rebuilt the Pantheon in Rome out of his respect for the gods. And the gods were absolutely crucially important to people for very good reason. The story got very distorted over time, but the basic reasons for paying your respect to the gods um, are very recent in terms of our human history, right the way through to 146 AD with Hadrian in Rome, and the Pantheon is now a Roman Catholic church. And by the way, in St. Peter's in Rome, uh, you've got the temple of Mithras in the basement. So if you go to Rome, please go to St. Peter's, but go down to the basement and pay your respects to Mithras. Baalbek platform, you see how much like a master bar it is. And my view is that all the important bits are underneath. They built these platforms and that's where they stored their valuables. That's where they went to go uh, when there was a threat of cometary debris. Uh, there may have been a big threat and they may have left the big stone of the south uh, 1,250 tons of it in the quarry because the threat uh, didn't materialize as they thought it was going to do. But clearly this is a kind of structure which would, would have stood a massive explosion of 100 hydrogen bombs that wouldn't have blown anything away much. Protection. And so my argument I'm putting forward in this lecture was that all our large megalithic structures in their many forms, we have to look at them as primarily as places to go, rather like wartime Anderson shelters. When, we, when the bombs were falling, we went to the best cover we could. And every house in Switzerland has compulsorily has um, a, um, a bomb shelter in the basement now with provisions. And it's not just a silly idea in terms of what we are going to be faced with over the next hundred years. This is a little clue 
uh, weathering here of the old structure, the Roman structure on top. Very important. And that is the kind of beautiful, beautiful place. The biggest temple ever built on the planet, um, the tallest columns, and they, all these columns were made of Aswan, pink Aswan granite, bought all the way from Aswan in Egypt, up here at 3,000 feet above sea level. Absolutely unbelievable. And the whole story here. And of course, underneath that big platform, we know there are rooms and all sorts of things going on, but we haven't quite done the job that the Knight Templars did in Jerusalem where they buried away for two years and found uh, a treasure, or it looks as though they found a treasure in the platform, which was the place to look for treasure. And it still is, for that matter. Other important early sites of sophistication. Kettle Hayek, 7,500 BC, that's the occupation mound. Christian O'Brien identified fruit fly chromosomes here, so people were using microscopes and doing biology and studying the fruit fly, which is the key species to study if you're a scientist in going into a new area, new territory, and looking at all the plants and everything. So we have that kind of sophistication going on. And how do they polish a mirror of the obsidian without scratching it? And how do they drill holes so small that no fine model needle can penetrate? And that wasn't... Uh, uh, geopolymers, that was actually uh, uh, rocks which were genuine rocks. They did use geopolymers and did wonderful things with um, concrete um, and molded substances which hardened. So they had, uh, there's just three very interesting technical skills there. Hamilcar, major city in Surah, 6000 BC, there are the bits and pieces. This is the Halafian ceramics uh, and a lovely lady who wrote wonderful books and that is the sophistication of their pottery, uh, ceramics, which wasn't improved upon until the 18th century. And you find that from, say, 6,000 BC to 5,000 BC in this area of the uh, Near East. Now, this is from Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings by Charles Hapgood, which uh, Graham Hancock referred to last night. Crucial book, very important. I haven't dealt with any of the map issues, but we know the world and the sky was mapped in incredible detail uh, as early as we have records and even earlier. And this is the pyramid which Hapgood identified as certainly being the oldest pyramid in the world. Um, and the reason for that was various lava flows that had covered the footings of this building. And this was taken by Gary Billcliffe. And Gary Billcliffe is part of our, if you like, our group uh, and has done wonderful lectures on the Etruscans and this early megalithic work. And I'm going to show two of his favorite slides in a minute. Now, you like this one. Where did you get that hat? And I've just shown that after the Mexico shot, because this is what we find not only in the Phoenicia um, and Turkey, but also in Palenque and Veracruz and Mexico. And you can see the similarity of the hats here. And this was about this time. We're, we're, we're talking about the old kingdom time, 2,900, 3,000 BC, um, these hats. And they were very fashionable. And Mithras had a hat like that too. And, uh, and I think you've all seen hats like that in history. But um, it's a wonderful drawing by a lady called Ruth Farrell, who was part of this Verrill and Verrill team who wrote Ancient American Civilizations, an absolutely essential read, the best book on ancient American civilizations. And I've just received the proof, all the documents ready to go to print for Gods Who Were Men, which was handed by Ruth Farrell to Bernard de Lair before she died. It's a sensational book uh, and opens up all kinds of interesting avenues about what was happening in the Americas and how crazy we are to think that we weren't there thousands of years ago because we were and our ancestors were. Well, I say we were because we're part of our ancestors. Development in Sumeria. Um, this is the reason for the genius of the few was this incredible archaeologist um, called Andre Parrot. I'm not going to run any archaeologist down, but there were some outstanding people, um, uh, Flinders Petrie, for example, and Samuel Noah Kramer. But he's, this is his quote. Now that we can view the Mesopotamian basin in all its splendor, it's becoming clear that this flame that blazed so suddenly in the Middle East and shed so wide a light was kindled at several points, each with its own nuisance and distinctive Luster, Susa, Lagesh, Yur, Yuruk, Ashnukak, Asa, Nineveh, Mari, all alike were centers whose civilization advanced from strength until, thanks to the genius of the few and the boldness of the many, there was wrought forth, as in an alchemist cru crucible, a prodigious 
many-sided art. And that was O'Brien's favorite quote from those times and why he called the book the genius of the few. And what did we find at Uruk? Um, dates now 4,500 B to 3,250 BC. We find a, a Taman dedicated to Anne. Now the word temple comes from Taman, but Taman just simply meant a, a sacred area. And it was always a sacred area to these gods who had delivered civilization to us. And that was the tradition that followed down. It's very, very important to realize that they didn't have a religion as such. They had a way of doing things. And this is what the Egyptians, a way of doing things. They were a damn, damn good way of doing things. And the same with the Druids. It's a way of doing things. And the Druid links go right back to the Skarsag site through people like Ugmash, Sharmash, Ogimus. And you can see the drink, dr dr links there. The Druids were the descendants of a Tuatha Dé Danann. And Tuatha Dé Danann, the people of the god Anne. We have all these links going back through, which are very important. And the last lecture was interesting because we're looking at how religion has taken so much of the old order and converted into a Christian viewpoint. And if we can just get, go back to 3000, 4000 BC, we can see how so many of these stories have been distorted, but there's a lot of basic truths there. So we mustn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as they say. Uh, Uruk again, um, and that there was a white temple um, on top of a building just this big in this town, which was the temp white temple to Anne. And that just shows you what's there now. This is where the Karsag epics were found, which is in the Nippo Library, which was excavated. Fortunately, it was destroyed, but clay tablets don't burn. They might break up a bit. Um, but they managed to rescue a fantastic amount of information from the Nippa Library, a crucial area. And still nobody really knows how to translate it. And the point is O'Brien took on this particular job. I went to an international conference on the Feistos disc and was appalled to find not one person who really understood what the very early uh, the vertical picture signs was all about and how far back they go and how that was quite separate from the Aleph Beg, which was the in-house speedy writing of Enoch. And these are the areas where you've got farming on those rivers, irrigated farming. Nippa is there, and, and Shurupak was a great administrative center where the kings used to go for the council of kings. The Druids used to come back to these areas early on to have council meetings every year so that they ran everything. And when things were in trouble, they appointed a king of kings, so the Shishak or an Ozymandias, or a Bradwald in Saxon times, um, or a Pendragon in England. This is where we get these stories from and where they come. It's all back to this incredible social organization here, going back a long way. But a population, the same time that Stonehenge was being built and the pyramids were being built, we had a population at Shurupak of something 15 to 30,000 people in an area of about 100 hectares, with a city wall and developed military organization. And the soldiers were there to protect the farmers transport in Samaria, a little bit from Zechariah Sitchin, who made lots of contributions, but got the wrong end of the stick. And his translation of cuneiform was based on older, later material. And he didn't attempt to go back to the beginning, as Christian O'Brien did. And therefore, um, he, he, he was in real trouble. Now, I'm rushing through this now. And this is the story from the Indus Valley to Dolivera town, a wonderful city on the Indus Valley. And you've got um, the uh, Indus Valley was colonized by the Sumerians. And when the river flooded, they filled the chambers of water. Uh, Lothal, and then you go off across the Pacific in these double-hulled canoes. Um, this is what you find on the way. The Pacific is full of the most fantastic megaliths. And I picked that one out because I think it's unique. And there were um, rows of these, 10 pillars either side, and two rows. And must have had a roof on it of some kind. Um, this is the soup where you would have landed on the coast of Peru and then from the, down the Amazon you were having people coming the other way and massive farming and food production coming from the other direction down the Amazon River. This is the, uh, uh, um, the um, small spider um, which um, has its reproductive organ, organ on its leg and you can only see it, you can't see it without using a microscope. Very, very interesting point. So these people were, had microscopes. They were doing all the science. Megalithic structures again, terraces, 
terrific mega structures here. I'm not quite sure how tall these are, but these ones here, uh, many of them are over 11 or 12 feet high, and they've never moved from the time they were built through earthquakes or anything else. Fantastic system of land management and farming management, all labor intensive, very effective because they could put just the right amount of water on their crops. China here, quite extraordinary features. Now, if it wasn't worth doing, they wouldn't have done it. Gary Belcliffe with um, an Etruscan polygonal tower, uh, only one like it outside Bolivia. We think that that architecture, megalithic structure, is common to South America. It's not, because it came from the Etruscans and the Pelagesians. And here is a, a Pelagesian wall in Greece, which Gary's photographed, five miles of wall, and some of the biggest stones are at the top. Absolutely sensational. And his work is marvellous. You can look at his work on the Holistic Channel and on the DVDs. A pyramid in Greece, same kind of story. Old Kingdom Egypt, we've got Saqqara, um, and the wall around Saqqara is virtually identical to this wall here at Kish. Almost the same building families would have come to Egypt because the Sumerians came to Egypt. That's why everything is there right from the start, because it was moved from Samaria to Egypt. So the Egyptians didn't build the pyramids, the Sumerians did, the Aryan Sumerians built it, or built them. And at the same time as they were building pyramids in Egypt, we've got this kind of step pyramid, same dates, in the Chiquima Valley, Peru, to show the point that they were all around the world. And these mud brick suctures are still there today, absolutely fine, 7,000 years later. Ngzosa uh, at Saqqara. And underneath Saqqara, we've got these enormous uh, structures underneath Saqqara. And this, in my mind, proves beyond, uh, absolutely conclusively that these structures were to hide from the wrath of God. And this is what we hear about the, the big platforms, that it was, uh, they were built to hide from the wrath of God, which was the cometary debris, cometary catastrophe. An enormous number of people, facilities, maybe air, water, all the things needed for a real blast. And at this particular time, they built all the pyramids within about 100 years uh, to very high specifications. It was not for dead people. It was to keep uh, the population, of many of the population as possible, alive. And if they couldn't get into the pyramids, they'd get into the master bars and all the surrounding structures. M granite, possibly machine. This is an interesting image just to show you more sophistication at Giza. And this made my mind up that these buildings were for, um, if you like, Anderson shelters, bomb shelters. Um, sorry, I've got a problem. Okay, it's okay. And so we've got, uh, in the middle of that, a terrific amount of space. That's looking down the shaft, into it. That's looking up the shaft. And the Americas, we've got Tionaco again, uh, not far from Lake Titicaca, Puma Punka was the port. Uh, extraordinary structure there, and I put this in because I wanted to show you megaliths, look, big stones, and in between them, they're filled in with a much later brick wall. Very interesting. I'm sure this happened a lot in Britain with our stones and our stone circles. This is a particularly important point. This is the kind of landscape we see as the remains of early farming, what's left on the ground. And this is all around this great Lake Titicata Basin, 54,000 square kilometers, and up on the hills where they cleared all the stones for their grazing animals, massive walls, and nobody really understands what they are, but I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that they're all part of the whole farming system. This is for growing the crops, and the uplands and the hills were for the grazing animals. Sandstone brought 20 kilometers, 200, 300 tons. Uh, massive slabs at Puma Punka, uh, 150, 200 tons, and there was an earthquake at that time, so maybe this was built before that earthquake. Uh, this is a famous fort, as you know, there are two images. That is the close-up, and that is a more distant view here on the hill above Cusco. Uh, you've seen these wonderful images, um, just breathtaking, really. In Egypt, uh, this is the Dardis in Syria. Some of the biggest blocks you'll ever find anywhere on the planet was built just to wall in an island, the Ruad Island in Syria. The Ozaran at Abydos, that was clearly, as were all the Abydos so-called tombs, they were specifically organized for people to go and take cover. 
and this was from about um, 3200, 3300 BC when we have this uh, called Scorpion Kings in Egypt. Malta, same story, corbelled roof, everything they could to rebuild or build something that was very efficient inside but as strong as a cave. And of course the valley temples, there's the Sphinx and these are the two temples and th these were built from the material excavated here. So these are as old as the Sphinx, however old the Sphinx is. Uh, on the Golden Heights we've got this extraordinary structure to 42,000 tons of uncut black volcanic basalt field stones all piled up here. Um, this is a, what a typical passage grave looks like um, and a, a specification of how they were originally designed. Um, and we've got a, a confirmation of that here. And all the many different types of, 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 of chambers, but uh, my belief is they were totally practical, very important. The platforms, Baalbek, and this was um, a platform was built by Cain to hide from the wrath of God. This temple in Cyprus, I haven't got a picture of it, it's really a tamer, but the point is, look how big it is. It's 630 feet broad in a 240 by 165, so 700 by 630 feet. And the bluish granite had to be imported from Egypt or Silesia. And the blocks are extraordinary, large, 16 weighed. How did they do it? This is the other story here. Mythology says that both Baalbek and Persopolis structures were built on the instructions of Jin Bin, uh, which means Jin, son of Jan. So Jin, son of An, as lurking places for the genii to hide, because genii is an Arabic word for the shining ones. And this has many stages of development. So the original structure, uh, the same, was built as a lurking place uh, for the genii to hide from the wrath of God. Massive platform here at Tula, much later, with the sacred baskets, which we find all over the world, uh, following on from the Sumerian tradition. Tiryns, very interesting. We've got a Megaron here, uh, which is a central place where the royal family go when the sky is falling, so that they're really safe in a small central shelter. Terrific uh, platform here. Uh, this is um, 200 meters square. Um, and about 30, 40 feet high at least, um, massive staircases and columns all the way around it. But the really important parts would have been underneath there, rather like the platform at um, Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, Palmyra, Damascus, Baalbek were all temples um, to Baal, Baal Hadad, and we saw Hadad earlier. Osiron is now flooded, but look, we've got the mortise and tenon joints here and this was clearly meant to be a roof structure. Here we are again, mortise and tenon joints. And where do we find those? Stonehenge. And even greater sophistication with the stonework in a different way, a more artistic way here. Very important. It would have had, in my opinion, quite clearly, a very effective and strong uh, wooden roof. And some an engineer reached that conclusion and actually built a model. And if anybody can tell me where the model is, please let me know. Blue stones. Now, I, I touched on Stonehenge, and blue stones are very special, and the reason for blue stones is because they contain the highest amount of natural monatomic elements, platinum group mat, uh, elements, and anybody who's looked at Gardner's work will see the links and clues here. It has all sorts of special qualities. It's very, very important. But we're using a similar process, a low voltage. I put in at the acupuncture points behind the ears, and this lady received neuroelectric therapy. That's her heroin addiction, 10 years of heroin addiction, day one. That's three days later, and that's six days later. And this method was used in Yeovil Hospital by Professor Carl Smith um, and Dr. Meg Patterson in 1982 with a 90% success rate in the National Health Hospital, and it has not yet been adopted. It's one of the greatest scandals we have in this country. Absolutely outrageous. That is a unit. It just hang around the weight like a, a race, like a little radio, and right behind the ears. Crucial. And what we now know is that our brain reacts in many ways, and we are electric, we're magnetic, we're sensitive. And what the ancients understood is how to fix the brains, fix people's brains. And this is part of the whole blue zone. I'm going to go very quickly now. And there we are, the human brain here, uh, key parts. And it's balancing these parts, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, 
ray, uh, the waves of people's brains is the new exciting technology. If you get the brain waves right, the body heals itself. And the bluestone technology was at the heart of that. So we've learned from uh, the ancient knowledge. I don't know why it's happening. Sorry, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm nearly finished. I've just got to do the last slide and the big, the big finish coming up, folks. And then I've got to get rid of this damn thing. It should go away. I don't want to end the show. Okay, we're there. So we have all the traditions within the Druids and across the world everywhere uh, of meditation. This isn't the wild hunt. This is a guy with a, 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 here is meditating. And this meditation goes back to the earliest, earliest times. And it's part of this process of what people would have been doing in Stonehenge with the help and assistance of what's in the blue stones. Now, where do they come from? Possibilities. That is Christian O'Brien's um, identification of an island exactly the same as described by Plato on the Azores. Go to the website. You can lift it in and out of the water and play around with it. This is a Mars image, what Mars really looks like. And this is such crucial work, and please go to marsanomalyresearch.com, J.P. Skipper, because this has just blown my mind in the last five weeks, and I've done a, a fair bit of research on it, and I still take it seriously. But look what's happening. Hail crater on Mars. We're going in closer, and you can just begin to see something on the ground. Do you see? A little bit more. What are we seeing here? Do you see the lines? And you look closely, they don't look as though they're any other than something on the ground. Closer, more realistic. This is why I showed you the picture of the Tiernaco Basin, the features. Closer again, it's becoming more obvious that we've got something like field systems on Mars in that hail crater. There, even more so. We're going in closer all the time different area and saying different kind of features but something's happening on the ground what is it and these are the skipper uh, analysis where he's really worked it out and you can see very very clearly we've got extraordinary features on the ground in the hail crater which we have to investigate now it's either a fraud a scam or it could be something interesting and if we have an open mind we want to pursue it and have a look and so there we are um, maybe our 25-day clocks come from the 25-day rotation of Mars, and we were seeded by Martians right about 50,000 BC. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs>